Hello, this is Yana Balakovic with UC Cooperative Extension. I'm the Forest Advisor for Humboldt and Del Norte Counties. And I'm here to talk about the second part of this Oak Woodland Restoration portion of our Oak Health class. Uh, this is going to focus on using the earlier section's data to apply it to a management context. So again, this section is going to focus on the effects of restoration and some of the new permits that are available for restoration. Um, Again, want to acknowledge this great team of folks that I got to work with, uh, landowners, researchers, uh, policy folks, um, and, uh, and some a uh, great agency partners to help get us to this stage. We've got a lot more data than we're going to show today, um, but the exciting part is that uh, the data has been used and we are now seeing um, more tools available to help uh, landowners who are interested in doing oak woodland restoration achieve their goals. So let's talk about restoration first. Like, okay, so we, we established in the earlier section that uh, these uh, Oregon white oak and California black oak trees are being encroached in by um, Douglas fir in particular. And uh, those canopies of the oak trees really begin to decline. Um, they lose canopies, they lose branches. And um, while some of those trees are very old, um, what, what happens if you remove those uh, fir trees? Uh, can you do that safely and um, without damaging the oaks too much? And will the oak trees be able to respond to that increase in light availability and reduction in competition? So we did another research project. Uh, we looked at 14 research sites uh, that had been previously funded by the Natural Resources Conservation Service primarily, a little bit of U.S. Fish and Wildlife funding in these projects. And we looked at what the effects of um, restoration are five years later following the restoration. We had 10 sites in Humboldt and 14 sites in Trinity. And on the left, you can see um, an oak tree that had lost a lot of canopy, um, pretty narrow overall in its shape. Uh, but now um, look at the amount of uh, new leaf material that is um, present on that oak tree. Very fuzzy looking. Uh, so there's all these adventitious buds that are able to respond to that increased light availability. Um, and over time, we believe that those trees will be able to establish new branches and, uh, and, and build out a much more full crown. On the right, you can see that um, an image of a tree that's, you know, again, it got a lot more light, but you can see that um, very quick and rapid response in, in foliage development. So here's some, uh, a couple of before pictures and after pictures. Um, you can get a sense that the sites that are being utilized uh, for these restoration projects. Uh, and so these are done with cost share assistance dollars, uh, not on a commercial scale, um, but they're dense, uh, they're crowded with Douglas fir, um, and the post-restoration effect uh, really helps show that the grasses are able to reestablish and um, some of the seed bank is still present perhaps, uh, and we're able to see a, a restoration back to a, um, a condition that's more like how these stands existed for, for quite a long time. So what we want to show here is um, both the grass and the and the forb community, so that whole other group of other herbaceous plants, you know, their dry mass changes post restoration. Um, and here's a look at some of these these ranches that we've been working on where this restoration work is happening. And you can see that the treated, which is in green, um, compared to the control, so I'm going to look at the top graph first. Um, we have a whole lot more grass response uh, in the tree and the post treated stands than those that. Um, had no restoration activity. So the grass species are able to, to respond and we're getting pounds per acre that's, um, that is uh, significant there. The forbs, um, so those other uh, plant species, um, are responding but not quite as strongly as, as the grass species are. And I, we think that's a little bit of a function of time in these cases. These stands were you know, only a few years post restoration. One of the things, though, that is super fascinating to me is to look at um, whether or not you can get radial growth response. So is that oak tree able to put on new diameter growth after restoration? And so what I want to show you are a series of um, cores, um, so tree cores that were done um, to be able to answer this question. And you can see on the core on the left um, the growth response. And so this is from a control site. Um, 
this is in Trinity County, and you can see that over time, basically, the radial growth is, is decreasing in separation. So uh, the red lines, and those represent a year from 2005 to 2016, the, red, the distance between the red lines is decreasing. So the trees were shutting down uh, on this site. So this site didn't have restoration. This is one of our control sites, and you can see that, um, in fact, the trees were slowing down during the same time period. And this is in comparison to um, a tree, again, in Trinity County that uh, we did a, a core on. And you can see the separation between um, the red lines begins to increase through time. So post-restoration, this tree is able to put on a, a rather rapid amount of growth in a short amount of time. So it's encouraging to see that these trees are capable of surviving. This is a particularly dry site, so I think the, um, the competition from water was really pronounced, uh, and so this probably made a significant difference. Uh, here's another um, site, again, in Trinity County, and you can see that the increase in, in growth is quite evident. So um, kind of fun to be able to kind of check our assumptions uh, and see that these trees are capable of responding. So I'm going to summarize a whole lot of data quickly and just say that, you know, what we've concluded out of this is that the oaks are declining rapidly with conifer encroachment. Um, the oaks in general are older uh, and oftentimes larger in diameter than the Douglas fir. We see that oak regeneration is occurring, but the seedlings do not advance in size class and they, they are failing essentially over time. We've been able to establish that plant biodiversity declines rapidly with encroachment. Um, and that the time for the Douglas fir and these sites to become dominant or co-dominant ranges from 20 to 40 years. So this process is happening rather quickly. We are heartened, though, to see that following the removal of those conifers, that um, the grass and forbs are able to respond, as are the oaks. So um, using this information, um, some of us worked together to try and figure out how we could facilitate um, the permitting process to make this with this work and the challenge is that the california forest practice rules had some barriers in the rules that uh, made it difficult to facilitate this type of restoration and i don't want to get too much in the weeds but i just want to say that the rules describe uh, and define that the post commercial harvest stocking standards meet certain criteria and those criteria mean that Group A species, which are all the conifers, shall not be reduced relative to group B species. So in other words, you can't come in and high grade the higher value trees and just leave a stand of lower value trees. And that makes sense in the rules. Uh, the, other th the other element is that there's a proportionality element in the, in the prior rules that needed to be met so that if you had a certain amount of group A to group B species pre-harvest, that that same proportion is maintained post-harvest, even though it can be a lower total amount. Um, and then there's a further issue of conversion. You don't want to convert a conifer stand into a hardwood stand um, because that's reducing the site capacity and reducing the overall stand characteristics. So these three things uh, basically were three legal barriers to doing oak woodland restoration. And so just to you know, remind us all, group A species are all the, all the conifers. And in this case, we're mostly focused in on Douglas fir. And group B species are a whole lot of hardwoods. Uh, and our interest here is really the California black oak and the Oregon white oak. Uh, this is for the coast district. Um, I'll show you some of the forest districts in a, in a minute. Um, but we recognize that the oaks were there first. And then these conifers are getting established. And the site is now having to be managed as a conifer site. And that's um, you know, working against the goals of some folks, um, some landowners' goals. And so prior to these changes in the rules, if you cut a conifer tree, you needed to replant a conifer tree. And so you couldn't come in and remove a conifer tree and then um, not replant. Uh, that wasn't legal in the current rules. So uh, through a lot of science work and policy discussions, uh, we've been able to create two new pathways to make it possible that um, that you can remove these encroached Douglas fir into oak woodlands and um, commercialize them. So some of them have commercial value, at least for firewood or uh, for um, chip. Uh, and there's a few saw logs that are able to come out of these sites too. So that we're not just paying for this kind of work through cost share assistance programs from the, that the state and federal government provide. So the land is able to realize some return on their investment, pay for some of their restoration activities. 
some cases might make a small profit, most cases probably break even or just subsidize some of the overall expenses. So there's two pathways now forward. Um, and for those of you who you know, aren't in this field, I won't spend too much time um, going into it, but for the foresters out there and the land managers out there that are working in private forest lands, there are some, some unique options. Um, one is called a special prescription, and I'll describe that in a, in a bit. Um, it applies to the coast and northern districts, and you have to have a minimum of 35 square feet of oak basal area post treatment. So if you recall from that earlier section, uh, we saw that oak basal area does persist. And so it, we're trying to work in stands where the oaks are still alive, not where they've um, all you know, fallen out of the system. And um, the second element we were able to do is create an exemption. Um, so this is for smaller diameter material um, so that you're um, exempt from um, certain activities such as replanting, but you're still subject to all the normal standards within the forest practice rules. So it doesn't, it doesn't mean you can cut and run, doesn't mean you're not mindful of water courses or all the other important elements that the forest practice rules keeps, in tra keeps landowners in track of. So um, you still have to do all the same stuff in both of these. It just gives a pathway so that your post-harvest um, uh, stand meets stocking or meets the proportionality rules and meets those other criteria that we're terming to be barriers in the rules. So where do these two permits um, apply? Well, they apply to the coast and northern districts, which are shown in dark green coast, northern district light green. Um, but there are a couple exclusions. Um, they don't apply to the southern subdistrict of the coast district, which you can see are parts of Marin and San Mateo and Santa Cruz counties. And it doesn't apply to the southern district uh, of, Cal of the forest practice rules defined districts in California. So these permits are not um, applicable everywhere, but they are giving some tools and resources to folks that didn't have them before. I put together a, a decision tree to help folks kind of work through which permit you, you'd want to do where and um, what some of the options are. And I know that's more than I can show in the slideshow here. So I will attach that as a separate um, piece into this website. So we'll be able to look at those in more detail. Anyone's welcome to give me a call. Um, again, the major determinant is this is when your these permits are available when you're trying to work in trees that are kind of commercially sized. So let's say 12 inches at diameter at breast height, so it's about four and a half feet off the ground uh, and greater. Um, but you have to have uh, 35 square feet of oak basal area post-treatment. Um, the exemption is for um, stands where the conifers are less than 26 inches at some height. Uh, the exemption is a simpler process, but you need to, it's just really for smaller trees overall. Um, and you're limited to 300 acres uh, per five years per um, planting watershed. The special prescription, on the other hand, um, is something that you can apply to your normal harvest planning process, um, and you can have conifers of any diameter. So special prescription is probably something that would be applicable when a normal harvest plan is coming together and, you, and, you're, and you've got oak woodlands uh, in and amongst these stands. So some new options, and again, I'm just going to wrap up and say I'm really grateful for this team to be able to work through um, the science as well as the policy, and it's exciting to see these permits getting used on the ground. Feel free to give me a call if anyone has any questions. Thanks.